Hi everyone, my name is Tobias Matei. I'm the deputy editor of the North American Spine Society Journal, and I have the pleasure of having with me today Dr. Charles Crawford III. He's the first author of an article entitled Predictors of Segmental Lumbar Lordosis Following Midline Posterior Transfer Emerald Lumbar Interbody Fusion. Does interbody device type matter? Thank you very much for being with us today, Dr. Crawford. Thank you. It's an, it's an honor to be here. Would you like to start maybe introducing yourself, your practice, your main research interest, and how you ended up designing this study, what goals maybe you wanted to accomplish um, with, with this research? Absolutely. Yeah, so I'm, I'm Charles Crawford. Uh, some people know me as Trey. Um, I um, work at the Norton Leatherman Spine Center uh, in Louisville, Kentucky. I'm part of a big um, academic group there. Uh, that has a long history of doing uh, re, uh, clinical, a lot of clinically based research primarily. Also affiliated with the University of Louisville. Uh, I'm a professor in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery. Um, and so in addition to teaching medical students and residents and, and our fellows, um, I spend the vast majority of my time taking care of uh, pediatric and adult uh, spine patients. So we do, we do the whole gamut, but um, like a lot of people's practice, you know, my practice um, tends to focus on a lot of degenerative problems uh, just because that uh, seems to be the most prevalent uh, issue uh, in society, the most common. So adult uh, degenerative is a big part of my practice. Um, you know, we've, we've done a lot of different areas of research. Really, we, we have uh, conferences every Monday and Thursday morning with our fellows and the residents and, and my partners. And we, we constantly are coming up with different clinical questions. Uh, and some of those questions we feel like we can um, answer with some of the data that we have available to us and uh, some of the students and residents and fellows that are interested in projects. Um, so this particular study um, evolved you know, over many years uh, with internal discussions in our group, but also you know, seeing things presented and discussed at, at national meetings, in, including NAS. And uh, there's this perception and, and, and literature support that uh, T-lift um, or a, a posterior interbody fusion, really a PLIF, T-lift, whatever you want to, uh, whatever your preferred term is. Um, sometimes we even use the term mid-lift uh, nowadays. Um, but we are... Um, that it's not a lordosing uh, procedure, that if you need lordosis, um, that a, a posterior interbody fusion might not be a good uh, procedure. And so there's some debate about that. You know, obviously some surgeons believe that you can uh, restore or create lordosis with a posterior interbody fusion um, and others uh, disagree. And then another, a big part of that as well is does the type of interbody device that you use, you know, whether it's designed uh, to be placed very anterior in the disc space, or is it designed as more of a straight in or bullet uh, style implant, uh, does that make a difference? Um, so that's, that's basically, those are the qu clinical questions we had when we designed this study. Um, you know, we're lucky to work in a really large center where we have a high volume of, of patients because of my eight uh, and now nine partners that are uh, doing surgery in addition to our fellows. Um, so we had a, we have a large uh, population of patients. And at this time period, when we were doing this study, uh, because there was this controversy and disagreement, uh, we, some of us were using one style of implant, others were using another style. Some of us were going back and forth between the two styles of implants, trying to figure out which one worked the best. Um, so that, that's where we, that's where we started. So I want to give our listeners a little brief overview about your methodology and results. And then later, of course, if I miss something, please correct me. But uh, basically, this is a retrospective study that involved a total of 61 patients. And your goal was to compare uh, radiographic parameters preoperatively and postoperatively, special, with special attention to the restoration of lumbar lordosis. Uh, when comparing two groups. One is what you call straight-in technique. Most surgeons uh, would be calling probably a bullet cage uh, with what you call a crescent-shaped implant or a banana cage, which is designed to be placed usually unilaterally, sometimes through a minimally invasive, even through an open approach, but which is designed to be located more anteriorly 
um, in the disk space. And basically, you found for most parameters you analyze, especially in terms of the gain of lordosis, you find a wide um, variability in the range of restoration or even loss of lordosis in some cases with no statistical, statistically significant difference between the two groups. So one could conclude that, I mean, the difference between a bullet trading cage, there's no difference between a bullet trading cage or a banana shaped cage in terms of restoration of lordosis. Um, and one thing that I find very interesting, and, and that's what I wanna focus our discussion on, uh, at the end of the, the article, you, you make a very interesting highlight that you mentioned that probably the outliers in this series have more educational value than the actual average results in terms of the lack of the statistically statistical significance. So um, would you like to expound on that and maybe your interpretation of the results? Yeah, definitely. So I, I do, I think there's a lot of interesting things about this article. Um, and, you know, one, one is that concept of, you know, when you look at group averages, um, you know, there, there's things we can learn from looking at group averages, but it really doesn't tell us much about the the outliers. You know, the the thing, the numbers at the extreme, where you know we've seen this with uh, some of the patient reported outcome research that we've done as well, right? You might do a, a surgery and you see on average, you know, you get a certain amount of improvement in the patient reported outcomes, but there's obviously there's some people that do really really well, and there's some people that do very poorly and they, they tend to wash each other out. And there, there certainly is value in group statistics, but we, when we looked at the group statistics for this study, you know, it basically shows what previous literature showed that um, on average, there's not much of a change from pre-op to post-op in, in lordosis with, with a poster interbody fusion. But then when I started going back and really looking at the data and especially that scatter plot, which is, is figure one, I believe in the article. So, you know, hopefully the audience has a chance to look at the figures. I think if you just look at the figures while you're listening to this, it's going to make more sense. Um, but you'll see that there's some patients where we restored a lot of lordosis. I think the upper limit was around 13 or 15 degrees. So we actually improved lordosis by 13 to 15 degrees in some of the patients, but there were other patients where we actually did the opposite. We actually kyphosed uh, the patient, or it seems that we kyphosed the patient. So we did some regression analysis. We were trying to tease out, you know, what is it, you know, and then also just visually looking at some of the case examples, which, you know, the case examples, the kind of the outliers that I put in there now from figure two to figure five. It shows you that really the main thing that made a difference was how the patient started. And so if we think about what is normal lordosis at L4, L5, normal lordosis is about 20 degrees or 18, 17, 18 degrees, depending on which reference you look at. And that's measured from the superior end plate of L4 to the inferior end plate of L5. Um, so if you look at that, that's about 18 degrees, I think is the literature average for segmental lordosis. And so what we saw is if patients were close to that number, uh, we tended to stay close to that number post-op, which, which is probably what we really want. You know, we really want, if, if we're doing a single level fusion, we just want to restore normal anatomy, right? So I think the surgeon, whether it was conscious or subconscious, you know, when they, their post-op x-ray that, you know, was acceptable, but it looked pretty similar at lordosis wise to uh, the pre-op. Now on the extremes, there's, there's types of spondylolisthesis at L4, L5, which is primarily what we were operating on at L4, L5, where the patient looks like they're falling forward, right? So if you can think about a person walking and they, and they trip over a curb, and their head falls forward over their feet, that's a falling forward kind of spondylolisthesis, right? The opposite would be, you know, somebody is walking on a slippery surface and they, they're walking on the ice and their feet come out from underneath them and their head falls backwards, right? So that, that's what I call a falling backwards uh, spondylolisthesis. So if you look at the first group, that, those patients, they're actually really kyphotic before surgery. 
And so those patients, when we restored them to that normal uh, lordosis, we really, those are the patients where we added a lot of lordosis from pre-op to post-op. But the patients that had the falling backward st um, spondylolisthesis, they actually started off a little hyper lordotic. They're probably a little more lordotic than we really want. But in some, a lot of those patients have foraminal stenosis because they're hyper lordotic at that segment, right? So that, that's probably what we're really consciously or subconsciously as a surgeon, we're trying to restore normal anatomy. So in those cases, it actually looks like we're taking away lordosis. And so I think that's where, you know, it was kind of an aha moment for me when I started looking at this. And those are all kind of concepts I had seen various places before, but, you know, really seeing those come together and, and helping us understand better what we're doing. Um, but, it, but, you know, just one additional thought about this is that, you know, there are technical factors, right? Sometimes, you know, we as surgeons can do a really, really good job at, at the carpentry type of, uh, you know, part of the surgery. And sometimes we don't, right? And some of that's, you know, doing enough posterior releases that we actually mobilize the segment. Um, you know, some of that is um, templating uh, and or sizing the implant appropriately. You know, if we undersize the implant uh, for the patient, we're probably not really going to restore the anatomy that, that we're trying to do. Or we're trying to, you know, the we're not going to accomplish the goal that we have in our mind. Um, but also, if we oversize the implant, we also block our ability to lordose at the end. Especially if you oversize an implant and you leave it posteriorly placed in the disc space, which really you can do with either design of implant, you know, just through technical uh, sub optimization, I guess. So. Yes, the, the, the most interesting insight that you provide, and I think it resonates with my practice, is the fact that you found that those patients with preserved lordosis, and I think you use a cutoff of 21, um, all of the loss of more than five degrees of lordosis were in that group. And conversely, all the patients that you had a, a more than five degrees increase in the lordosis were in the patients with less than 21 degrees preoperatively. And I think I see that in my experience. If a patient has a really collapsed disc space and I'm able to do uh, a posterior, a laminectomy with bilateral facetectomy and, and release the posterior elements and, and, and use my paddle shavers and I usually do bilateral implants and get a very anterior position of the cages, those are the patients that I can restore the lordosis. Conversely, those patients with preserved lordosis at this phase, I mean, my concern is not to lose what I already have. And I would like to hear your insights in terms of how ge generalizable those findings are. And I can tell a little bit of my practice. I started doing a lot of um, MIS tea leaves. And at some point, you realize that the best you can achieve with MIS tea leaves, tea leaves regardless of the technique you use, is probably preservation of lordosis. And now that I'm, I'm doing more deformity surgeries, um, in the beginning, actually, I was trying to correct most of my deformities with multi-level T-leaves. And I realized the best I can get uh, at one level is 12 degrees of lordosis, regardless of the preoperative lordosis, even with the, the, the expandable cages. I've transitioned to, to, using, to doing bilateral, what you call bullet-in um, cages, but with expandable cages that they can, can give me up to 18 degrees of lordosis. And like I said, at most, I usually tend to get only 12, um, but we we'll try to place them very anteriorly. And of course, at the end, compress the space. Um, but usually, I mean, to be honest, most of the deformities, I think the mistake during correction of deformities is to rely only on the tea leaf. So I can tell you, it's rare for me to see a patient that needs deformity correction and needs, for example, a T10 to pelvis, then you're going to be able to restore the lordosis only with multi-level tea leaves. I mean, usually they are off by at least 25, 30 degrees. And I think it's a little bit naive to think you can achieve just with tea leaves. So most of my cases, I tend to do a, a PSO. Um, but my question to you in, in terms of tea leaves, and, and I know you didn't evaluate here um, a graft subsidence, but I think one of the fears when you do, especially if you use expandable cage, there's some literature showing increased rate of subsidence. 
but I'm always afraid um, because you're covering only a very small surface of the, the 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 end plate. And if you try, especially if you try to use expandable cage, I mean that's very different from an A leaf or an X leaf where you you have the force distributed through the whole end plate. And that's why I transition to doing bilateral implants to try to get a little bit more doses, but at the same time distribute those forces. But I'd like to get your insights in terms of what you've learned with this data and what's your current practice in terms of may maybe your one level to leaves, but also how you apply these concepts to your deformity surgeries. Yeah, th those are those are all great points. Um, you know, and just just to clarify for the audience, you know, this study specifically looked at single level uh, fusions cases, right? So these were all you know degenerative single level cases that had did have some segmental deformity, but they were not, you know, thoracic to the pelvis uh, type patients. Um, I, I do agree, you know, with um, a lot of the, the comments you made. And, you know, in my personal practice right now, if I have a patient, you know, with a substantial, uh, you know, spinal pelvic malalignment, you know, flat back, positive, sagittal balance, whatever term you prefer. Um, I'm trying to um, think about the concepts that a lot of the surgeons are talking about with um, the gap score and other concepts where you're really trying to put the lordosis back into the spine where it, it normally should be, right? Which is really at the lumbosacral junction, L5S1, has the most lordosis and then four five is the second most. And then really in the upper lumbar spine, naturally most people don't have a lot of lordosis there. Um, so I, I tend to use a lifts more when I have a thoracic to the pelvis patient where I'm trying to restore lordosis. Now, if, if it's an unfused spine, right, I'm doing a lifts at L5 S1 and maybe at above that as well, but at least at L5S1. Um, if it's a fused spine, then that's where a pedicle subtraction osteotomy might be the only option. Um, with the concept of the T-lifts uh, subsiding, um, I, I definitely think that, um, you know, subsidence of, of any spine implant is an issue. And I think um, there are patient uh, specific factors like osteoporosis primarily that we really um, can try to pay attention to and optimize and, you know, sometimes alter our surgical plan uh, in patients with severe osteoporosis. We're doing a lot of work right now looking at uh, using the Hounsfield units on a CT scan, uh, which we think is more predictive of, of what we're going to see clinically you know, in this, in the area where we're operating versus a DEXA scan, but, you know, we're still doing a lot of work on that and, and learning more every day. Um, so I think, but paying attention to bone density is really important and trying to optimize that. Um, I, you know, I do think that, you know, it's, it's just, you know, physics that if you have a larger surface area with a, a lift or an X lift, or, you know, one of those other um, type procedures, um, then the, um, you know, might, it might subside less, but I've, I've seen some pretty bad subsidence case examples, not necessarily in my own practice, but presented at meetings uh, with those types of surgeries too. And again, you know, some of that might be the patient's osteoporosis, um, but it's also, I think, surgical technique related where we have to be careful um, when we're doing surgery that we're not um, violating the end plates, uh, for example, with our disc space preparation um, and then also that we're doing enough soft tissue release that we're not trying to um, rely on the strength of the bone to overcome a very uh, tight fibrous uh, ALL, for example, right? If somebody has long standing, you know, severe spondylosis and their ALL is very thickened and stiff, uh, you know, they might even be partially ankylosed at that segment you know, which I, I try to look at on a preoperative CT scan, you know, I, I think it's unrealistic to think that you're going to be able to overcome that by, you know, putting something into the disc space, um, you know, with a lot of force. So I think there, there's, I think there's definitely, 
you know, patient implant and surgical technique factors that go into all of that. I, I've done a lot of cases with two posterior inner body implants. Um, I think there's some upsides to that, but um, you know, there are some uh, time and cost uh, concerns with that technique as well. Um, so I, I would say that the majority of the posterior inner body uh, procedures that I do, I'm just using a single uh, implant. Uh, but I think in special cases, using two implants may be uh, very appropriate. And one of the things just to highlight to our listeners about the methodology of your paper, and it has some implications in terms of how generalizable those results are, or I'm not saying that they are not generalizable, but I, I think the listeners and our readers should take that into account when deciding, especially if they're thinking about switching from a, a straight in or a bullet technique. Uh, it seems that you're using all those cases, uh, cortical bone trajectory, and you did unilateral cages. And I, I've seen from the pictures, it seems that all the cages were were straight cages, right? They were not lordotic. So um, I think that that matters in some sense, because if someone, for example, is doing uh, a bilateral, like a gills procedure with bilateral facetectomies, high, uh, ca expandable cages that gives you up to 18 degrees of lordosis, um, and they're using a, 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 a traditional pedicle screws. And I'm not sure you can comment on how, how easy it is to, to compress at the end with cortical bone trajectory screws. I, I may wonder if the results may not be a little bit different, different but um, give me your insights in terms of, for example, how easy it's to compress with the cortical bone trajectory technique, or if you see any meaningful difference between lordotic cages or straight cages in your practice. Um. Yes. Yeah, so those are all great points too. Um, so we, in our, in our, in this specific study, uh, patient population, you know, there, there were, I think at least five, if not more, uh, attending surgeons contributing. And then also there's, you know, some resident and fellow involvement there. So there's a lot of generalizability with, you know, the surgeon's, uh, technique or ability, I think, because there's a, you know, it's a pretty good, pretty good sized group of, of different surgeons, um, I think that, you know, there are inner body, um, you know, the lordosis that's built into the inner body, I think is an interesting concept. Um, if you look, if you really study your preoperative images on uh, MRI or a CT scan, um, you know, we will see different shapes of end plates, right? For example, if somebody has mostly facet pathology, um, where their facets have become really uh, incompetent and they they're have a really unstable spondylolisthesis, they may actually have a pretty tall uh, disc space still. And that disc space is going to have uh, concave uh, in plates. You know, I think about it, it's almost that, that football shape uh, when you look at it from the side or, or even from a coronal CT or coronal MRI, you'll see it. You know, it's very concave in plates. And so I think in those cases, you know, if, if you think, you know, if I think that putting a flat uh, surface on a concave surface, even if the flat surface is really uh, lordotic, it doesn't really uh, contact the, the in plate everywhere, you, you know, we might think that it, it will. Um, and, I, and in those cases, I currently, I really prefer to use more of a, of a football shaped uh, implant that, you know, is it's actually a straight in implant, but it has this very convex surface. And so really, I think, I think we kind of, you know, as you compress, you kind of roll that, that concave surface over the convex surface and you can get lordosis. That's different than a patient that has a really collapsed disc, a chronically collapsed disc space where they get a lot of sclerosis and the implants are really flat. You know, I think in that in that patient, maybe a different, uh, you know, a flatter uh, implant surface may align better with the in, the implant or, or the the bony implant. Uh, as far as the question about whether you know the use of the cortical bone trajectory versus a you know more lateral to medial trajectory makes a difference, um, I I don't. Think, I, I think it's similar to the concept about the, the inner body device. I don't think that that is the most um, important thing. I think that um, 
the um, the strength of the of the screw in the bone uh, relies on two things. One is is the quality of the bone around the screw, right? And then and then the second thing is the the surface area contact, uh, you know, along that quality of bone. And so I think that if you're putting if you're preparing your screw track in a way that is preserving uh, the bone around the screw and you're going through a uh, harder bone, right? Which the cortical bone trajectory, you know, typically goes through a, a more cortical type of bone. Then I think that that screw, you know, that screw can be just as strong, if not stronger than a screw that's coming in more lateral to medial, right? Um, and then, you know, compression is, is, I don't think it's really different. Um, you know, as long as you have enough space between your screw heads at the end, you can still uh, compress. Um, so I think that just like, you know, what, you know, some surgeons may, you know, perform better with a certain inner body device, you know, some surgeons may perform better with a certain screw trajectory, maybe just based on experience. But I think that also you can, you can use either one. Um, we, we tend to prefer that cortical bone trajectory. Uh, again, you know, I think you made a comment about, you know, doing some um, like tubular T lifts or something early in your practice, um, or at least that's what I, I think you said. Um, I, I had the same experience. We, we had the same experience in our hospital. I mean, we went through this phase of doing tubular T lifts and there's just a lot, you know, some, some cases or some patients are great uh, for that procedure but we thought that there were enough patients where that procedure wasn't optimal that we've really switched to doing a lot of this more midline um, exposure and using the cortical bone trajectory to still try to keep it uh, minimally invasive um, or, you know, using that less invasive surgery concept and getting patients out of the hospital quickly, you know, with minimal blood loss, not using drains, small incisions, um, that concept. So. Hopefully that answered your question. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think uh, one of the very interesting things and what I like about this study is that when I see this the scatter plot, I see my practice reflected on that because I'm very confident that this is a group, as you mentioned, of very experienced surgeons. And you go to a single level T leaf and you say, with a great one spoon disease, you say, oh, this is a very routine surgery. We do it all the time. And sometimes, uh, you know, you start using your paddle shavers and um, the this, you, you're feeling you're going to violate the end plate or you're not able to reduce very well for one of those factors. For example, the ALL is calcified. And at the end of the case, you're very happy if you're not losing lordosis. And conversely, you go to other surgeries and especially with listesis, I had the experience that just by Sometimes uh, after inserting my implants and reducing the listesis, I already gained some lordosis. And at the end of the case, by compressing uh, between the head of the screws, I'm able to gain almost to get a final lordosis of almost 18, 18, 20 degrees. So I think that variability highlights how we should be meticulous in terms of our carpentry. You know, basic things like a, a proper posterior release of the facet joints. Even, even if you're not doing a bilateral facetectomy, I know some of my partners, they like to do the L cuts instead of doing facetectomies like I do. Um, you wanna make sure that everything posterior is released so you you have the ability of, of um, promoting some lordosis by uh, using the internal axis of rotation. The same thing in terms of the, the position of the implant, right? There's, there, there's an extensive literature showing that the farther away, the more anterior you are in relationship to the internal axis of rotation, the more you're able to compress and obtain that lordosis. Um, conversely, if you just stuff a very big cage right in the middle of the disc space, you're stuck with the cage there. And no matter how much you compress between the screws, you're not going to get that lordosis. So I think it really reflects the practice for who, who does transfer transfer lumbar interbody fusion that it's a great technique i mean you can treat especially for a single level surgery you can do your good carpentry and, and obtain uh at least preserve the lordosis and, and most of the times increase the lordosis and i think it highlights that you know especially for the deformity cases it's still a limited technique so i get the criticism that i said the meetings that especially if you do hyperlordotic a leaves or x leaves 
those are the techniques that you may get a substantial correction that you may be able to avoid posterior osteotomy. So uh, it's good to see that reflected in a scientific manner in terms of looking back toward experience, comparing both the, the, the straighting bullet as well as the crescent shape implant and, and, and see those, those findings uh, well documented. And I think in terms of, it's a personal choice, right? You said that in, in terms of what each surgeon does, you may start with an MIS technique. And then if you're, if you're doing more deformities, you tend to do more open cases. And then that's how you tend to treat even for patients with a one level disease. So I think there are several ways to, 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 to perform the surgery in a very satisfactory manner. Um, but these are very important insights uh, for our audience to have, especially for those who are still in that stage that they are kind of deciding how to, what technique to employ for, for, for each specific case. Anything else that you would like to highlight about the study or any conclusion after analyzing this data that, that or any important insights that you have? Uh, no, I, I don't think so. I think, um, I guess the, my final comment would just be, you know, if, if, if the audience hasn't had a chance to look at the figures, you know, go look at the figures and, um, you know, preoperative plan, right? So when you, you know, I, I, I think I do a much better job of this with, with more experience in my career, you know, where I, I look at um, the images, you know, try to anticipate you know, how much work I'm going to have to do, you know, understanding that not every case is going to be the same. Not every T-lift is the same. Not every mid is the same. You know, think about, you know, how is this patient different than, than the last patient or, or the same, you know, and I also do measurements and I try to anticipate uh, the size of the inner body uh, device that I'm going to use. You know, if I have a really small patient, I want to make sure that my inner body device is not too long. Uh, where it's going to be too close to the posterior disc space. And likewise, I, I want to make sure that I get the height uh, just right. I don't want something that's too short, and I don't want something that's too tall. Um, and I think measuring that preoperatively helps me uh, to stay in that in that range of where I should be. You know, I still do use intraoperative trialing, uh, uh, you know, to confirm that that's going to be appropriate. But um, I have a pretty good idea before... I start the case, um, what my inner body uh, size is going to be. Um, and that's something I do. I do a much better job of that now, you know, than I did five, six, seven years ago. And, and even in terms of evaluating, you make a very good point in terms of using CT scan for preoperative planning in terms of evaluating uh, the end plates. And one thing that I notice in a lot of patients is that you may have patients that have very calcified or or very strong uh, end plates laterally, but if you go at the center of the of the end plate, it seems a, a very poor bone quality. So probably those are not good patients to try to do a, a, a banana shaped cage that's going to be right at that region. And those are the patients that may benefit more from a straight in technique. And one of the other things that I noticed, and I've done that, I don't know if that's your experience, but if I have some coronal imbalance, and of course that applies more for the deformity multi-level cases than to, to the single cases, but I've have, have had a good experience in doing unilateral cages and compressing just on the contralateral side in terms of correcting the, the sagittal imbalance. So that makes sense to use that, that lever on as the cage on one side and then on the other side, you're able to compress and, and reduce the coronal imbalance. So that just highlights how, yes, uh, if uh, taking account not only the, the morphological um, uh, parameters of the CT scan, but also the house film units uh, in terms of the end plates, uh, it's a crucial step in terms of preventing subsidence and proper, properly planning your tea leaves. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Crawford. It's been a great pleasure to have you with us and we look forward to further research from your group. Hopefully uh, have, uh, to have you uh, or someone from your group back to, uh, to our podcast here at NASJ. I, I would like that. Thank you so much.